want. Joining us today on the podcast, we've got NFL draft analysts and at the draft wire and rough draft covering all things Chicago Bears for SB Nation's Windy City Gridiron, Mr. Jacob Infante. Jacob, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Kyle. Uh, appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's it's an exciting time. Absolutely. So got got a lot going on for sure. Well, I was going to say, you know, only one preseason game in, but it seems like the uh, Justin Fields hype train has already left the station here. It's, uh, you know, just describe the mood in Chicago right now, finally seeming to have a legitimate quarterback with your franchise for a change of pace. Oh, man. Uh, it, it's honestly unlike anything I've ever seen from a Bears perspective. Uh, there's so much uh, hype, not just for this year, but for the future. And there, there's been hype for individual years. There's been more in the past. Like we're talking uh, 2018, 2019 had a lot of hype going into it. But for the future, I don't think I've seen anything as bright and as optimistic as I've seen this year uh, with Justin Fields in the fold now. And after that first preseason game, obviously things have been, you know, boiling over here in Chicago and fans are excited. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited too. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a uh, a fun time to be a Chicago sports fan, unless you're a Chicago Cubs fan right now, because uh, yeah, <laughs> a bit, bit of a fire sale over there. So don't think Wrigley Faithful will be too happy. But hey, at least you got football right around the corner, right? Yeah, that's true. And thankfully, I'm a Sox fan, so I don't have to worry as much about <laughs> that. But I, I feel sympathy for the Cubs. I really do. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a small sample size of training camp to live from here. And we've got one preseason game. Obviously, Fields has looked really good in all of that. But do you think it's too soon to anoint him the week one starter? Like, are the Bears going to be patient with him and have him sort of ease him into it? Because Rams in week one, that's kind of a tall task, even for a seasoned vet. Like, who do you think is going to be under center for the first game? Uh, if I had to guess, I think I still think it's going to be Dalton. I think they'll give him a couple weeks and then turn it over to Fields. Uh, but my opinion is you don't rush Fields' development. You let him in when he's ready. But that said, I do think he's a better quarterback right now than Andy Dalton is. Mm-hmm. So, and I mean, and obviously I'm not in there every single day. I'm not, you know, part of that coaching staff and able to see firsthand exactly what's going on, you know, behind the scenes too. But judging off of his college tape, all reports from training camp uh, and it's a small sample size, but off of that one preseason game, I've liked what I've seen from Justin Fields a lot. And I'm excited to watch him in these next two preseason games to see if he's able to build upon that because he did struggle a little bit against that second string defense. So if he can uh, build on that against the bills, uh, especially in this upcoming week, uh, I think that would be huge for him, but that's just generally where I'm at. I think Justin Fields is more talented. He has the higher upside and uh, sure. Andy Dalton is probably going to be a little bit more reliable, uh, but you're not really going to be able to win games because of Andy Dalton. You'll be able to win games with Andy Dalton as a member of the roster Mm -hmm. with Justin Fields. He's the kind of guy who can help you win games. He can really be that difference maker. So that's just where I stand on it. But I, I think Dalton's going to start week one. I think give him a couple of weeks and then fields will be let loose. Do you think it would be a different conversation we'd be having right now? If week one, instead of the 2020 number one overall defense in the Rams, it was say the Houston Texans that the bears had on the schedule, or do you think it was always the plan of give them a couple of weeks and fields will be in there by whatever week four. Yeah. I, I think that does have some part in it. Uh, personally, I think that, yeah, sure. The Rams are, you know, they're a good defense and they've got some, you know, terrifying pieces, uh, on that roster. But my opinion is if you're an NFL quarterback, you're going to be facing those defenses regardless. So to sit out, you know, like one week, uh, just to avoid a defense, I think that, uh, it would be beneficial to him actually to be able to play against the Rams, to be able to see what that defense is like. And I, I say this with confidence in his mentality because I've seen at Ohio state and at, you know, in the preseason game, he showed this too. 
his ability to bounce back after a rough stretch. Uh, he doesn't lose confidence in his arm. He's still, you know, willing to go out and make plays. He doesn't play ultra conservative after throwing a pick or after going three and out. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to like in that regard. Whereas say with, you know, Mitch Trubisky, that's something you have to worry a little bit more about, uh, you know, that shaky kind of confidence on the field, but I don't think that's the case with fields. So I think that playing the Rams, I mean, sure. You know, it's a talented defense. I, I understand that argument. Absolutely. But, you know, my point of view of it is you're going to be facing a good defense, you know, at some point in your career, you know, you just start whoever's ready to make the biggest impact week one. Absolutely. And, you know, when you saw Carson Wentz go down and Indy departed, you think that Nick Foles was going to get traded to them and try and become the savior and all of that there? <laughs> I honestly kind of hoped that would be the case because <laughs> like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to bash on Nick Foles or anything, but they're paying him a decent amount of money to be a third string quarterback. And if they can get that salary off the books and get any sort of draft capital for him, I think that would have been a win. Uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like the Colts are you know, willing to go down that route, but I mean, either way, you know, it's still another veteran quarterback mind to have in the locker room. And it's not the worst thing in the world uh, to have, you know, another veteran guy who's, you know, won the Super Bowl. He's, he's been in the playoffs. He's made it to the Pro Bowl before. So uh, I guess you could say the more the merrier uh, in terms of having those bright minds to surround Justin Fields with. But yeah, I, I would I'd be lying if I said part of me wasn't a little disappointed they weren't able to get some draft picks for him. Yeah, there you go. Carson Wentz's worst nightmare there if uh, Nick Foles had come back in there. <laughs> but, oh, man. I would have loved to see how that would have turned out. Like if oh. uh, <laughs> Wentz and Foles back on the same team with uh, Frank, with Frank Reich, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Reunion <laughs> tour down in the AFC South. But yeah. I mean, uh, as an Eagles fan, switching gears a little bit here, I mean, I, I have a soft spot for Jason Peters because, you know, I, I live that experience. I think he's a hall of fame tackle i think he's going to camp like I, I have no doubt about any of that but i also lived the 38 year old jason peters experience last year yeah. and that was not pretty along the offensive line so with the bears now bringing him in are you a little bit worried about that left side of your offensive line heading into week one uh i mean a little bit i i, I do think that jason peters all told is a, a solid signing uh simply as a mentor as a guy who's, you know, been around the league, he's experienced, he's, you know, made it to numerous pro bowls, multi multi-time all pro with the Eagles. Uh, but, and again, like he did take that step back in 2020. Uh, and, and you, you probably know better than I would, you know, being an Eagles fan, but my perspective of it was Peters, you know, definitely took a step back, but he wasn't awful. And correct me if I'm wrong, and but uh, just judging off of, you know, like uh, what I've seen with PFF grades, which I know isn't the end-all be-all, but, you know, I, I did peruse those a little bit after the Bears signed Jason Peters. They seemed okay. And, you know, around the same as where Jermaine Effetti is at, you know, last year, uh, their current right tackle. Uh, so I, I think as a late pre, you know, as a preseason ad, you could definitely do worse than Jason Peters. And, as a depth guy with starting experience, you know, who can play guard if need be. Uh, I, I think it's solid enough. I don't, I'd be lying if I said I have the highest expectations for him in the world, but I, I do think it's a decent enough signing this late simply because they needed help along the offensive line there, you know, have a lot of guys going down with injury. You don't know exactly what's going on with Tevin Jenkins, uh, how his back injury is progressing. So at the very least, you have a guy in Jason Peters who can start there if necessary. And I honestly like him at left tackle better than anybody else that they have on the roster, not named Jenkins. So, I mean, it's, it's a solid signing, in my opinion, this late. Uh, and, you know, how well Peters will play, uh, time will tell. But I, I do think he's an upgrade, at least over what they had. Yeah, and it's absolutely impossible to really gauge anything based off of that last Eagle season because the amount of injuries we had on the offensive line. Oh, no. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't, it's hard, hard to figure out, okay, is Peters the problem? Is it the fact that we don't have a guard playing next to him? Is it the fact that Carson yeah. Wentz is throwing lame duck passes all over the field? So 
I, I wouldn't read too much into it there, but just as people start creeping ever closer to 40 years old there, it's starting to be like, oh boy, we're, we're relying on a 39 year old to uh, protect, yeah. protect uh, Justin Fields there. So always, uh, always interesting to get the hometown perspective on those. But last year, we got essentially two versions of David Montgomery. We had the weeks one through nine, which was fairly underwhelming and didn't crack over 100 yards in any of those games, struggled to crack 40 yards in some of those games. Then we had him really turn it on down the stretch. Now, from what you've seen in whether it's offseason workouts or, you know, training camp or even, you know, preseason action or anything like that, which way are you sort of leaning towards for David Montgomery this year? Is it going to be the Jekyll or Dr. Hyde version of him? Uh, I think I'm leaning more uh, the second half of the year. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think necessarily it's going to be to that full extent because I do think, you know, Damian Williams being in the backfield, uh, Khalil Herbert being there, one, whenever Tariq Cohen comes back, there are a lot of, you know, names in that backfield that Nagy's going to want to feed. So I don't think Montgomery will be as productive as he was, but I do think he can see similar efficiency. Uh, I do think, especially with Justin Fields, I think that uh, that's going to open a lot more opportunities in terms of uh, read options and with uh, RPOs, no, at, knowing the threat that, oh, you know, maybe this is going to be a read option. Defenses are going to have to try and respect Fields' athleticism there. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm encouraged with what I've seen from David Montgomery. Uh, by all accounts, he's gotten faster. Uh, you know, added maybe a tenth of a second off, off of his 40 yard dash time, which, you know, Montgomery's never necessarily been a speedster. He's more just been, you know, kind of shifty and a vacuum type of guy who can make defenders miss in the box and get, you know, solid uh, breakaway for a 10, 15 yard gain every once in a while. Uh, and, and I think we'll see a bit more of that this year. I do think that uh, strong, you know, strong runner with very, very good contact balance uh, and, you know, good shiftiness, uh, you know, change in direction. And he's a good receiver too. I don't think he gets enough credit for that. So you can add a little bit more speed to that. Then I think he's another guy. He can, he can top a thousand yards again, in my opinion, especially now that there's an extra game to work off of. I think that he will top a thousand yards. Uh, Will he be as efficient and put up as big of numbers as he did in the second half? I don't think he will to that extent, but I do think he'll be better than he was in the first half of the year. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, another player, obviously, who could have a huge boost to his stock uh, if Justin Fields is you know, an early starter in the season would be Allen Robinson, because since joining the league in 2014, he's had a largely forgettable cast of quarterbacks throwing the ball to him in Jacksonville and in Chicago as well. Yeah. So if Fields is as good as advertised and gets into the season early, like what's the ceiling on Allen Robinson's production there? Yeah, I I think that there's a high ceiling absolutely if, with Allen Robinson if Justin Fields is uh, starting at quarterback. I think the fact that Robinson has been as productive as he has been with you know subpar quarterback play over the course of his career, like you said, not just in Chicago and Jacksonville as well. Uh, I think that we're talking you know reliable you know hundred yards a game uh, or close to that you know, hitting a hundred, you know, pretty regularly. I think that's what something you could expect with Robinson if Fields plays and if he plays as well as many expect him to. Uh, either way, I think Robinson's going to be productive because he's the kind of guy who can, you know, make those catches in contested situations, you know, create, you know, just enough separation on those shorter routes like slants and uh, ins and outs and stuff like that where, you know, quarterbacks can hit him, you know, right in the hands. Uh, And I don't think that's going to change, but I do think that with better quarterback play, you could see more accurate passes, maybe use him a little bit more down the field. I know he's not a burner by any means. He's not like a Darnell Mooney in this offense or anything like that, but, you know, you could stretch the field with him a little bit, or at least, you know, take advantage of that intermediate game uh, and stretch the field a little bit. I think Robinson could see a little bit more of that with fields under center, Uh, and again, like I said with Montgomery, I'm expecting a thousand yards at least out of Allen Robinson, especially with how much of a high volume receiver he is. Uh, but 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited and hoping that, you know, once Justin Fields steps in at quarterback, they will be able to unlock Robinson's full potential, which, you know, obviously he's a very good receiver. I think that there's a slight uptick in production that we haven't seen from him because of the quarterback play. I think you could see that if Fields is the guy we all think he is. Yeah. Well, shifting focus from players to the coaching side of things here now, obviously Bears head coach Matt Nagy is under contract through 2022. Do you get the sense, though, that this is sort of a make or break year for the Bears? Or do you think that the organization has confidence in him and his coaching staff and are going to give him sort of a little bit longer leash with Justin Fields once he gets out there to groom him and really get him ingratiated into the system? Yeah, so I honestly, I was of the belief before the season that the Bears would be smart to rebuild and tear it all down, uh, try and dump off some of those bad contracts, get a new coach, new GM, all that stuff. Granted, that was before I realized that Justin Fields was going to be an option Mm -hmm. because I didn't see any possible option that the Bears would be able to get their QB of the future this offseason. Uh, now that they have that, though, I do think they'll, uh, you know, let the leash off a little bit in on Matt Nagy. I still think that it's, you know, his seat is pretty warm. I wouldn't say he's on the full on hot seat, though. I think that drafting fields gave him and Ryan Pace a little bit more time, uh, a little bit more leeway to say, oh, you know, we've got a rookie quarterback in, you know, give us a little bit more time next year. If he plays incredibly well, you know, that's going to be a really good look on us because we're the ones who drafted him. Uh, and if not, then, you know, let us go, but, you know, give us this opportunity to see what we can do with a new quarterback, with a guy who has, you know, a very high ceiling at the next level. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that Matt Nagy's leash is a lo- it, it's a bit more loose than it was uh, like near the end of last year. I, I still think that it's pretty warm, but I do think that selecting fields gave him a little bit more leeway for sure. Yeah. And speaking of that draft, I mean, NFL.com writers voted the Bears draft as the best rated draft of 2021. So outside of Justin Fields, who we know everyone in Chicago and their grandmother is excited about, which 2021 draft pick are you most excited about for the Chicago Bears this year? Yeah, so my answer here would be Tevin Jenkins. I don't know exactly where he's at from, you know, back injury perspective, he hasn't practiced, you know, all summer and he hasn't, you know, he didn't play in the preseason game. So, you know, time will tell exactly when he comes in. I do have really high hopes for him though. I I loved what I saw from him on tape. He was the guy I wanted them to take at 20. If they stayed put in the first round and they got him what 39th in the second round. So, you know, I was really happy with that pick, Uh, but if he doesn't play for a while or if the back injury proves to be lingering throughout the year, uh, then another guy I'm honestly kind of interested in seeing is Kyrus Tonga, the defensive tackle that they got in the seventh round, which I am aware that Eddie Goldman is, you know, going to be the starter. He's going to see most of the reps at nose tackle. I think there's going to be a role for Kyrus Tonga on this roster, you know, assuming he makes the team, which I think he will, uh, because he looked really good in that opening preseason game. They had him out with the starters on defense for those first couple of drives and he held his own. He didn't have any tackles, but he did a really good job of eating up gaps. He did a great job of, you know, holding his ground and, you know, being a true two gapper in the run game. I was really impressed with how he played. Uh, And then another guy I had my eyes on is Khalil Herbert, who I mentioned earlier with that backfield, uh, he played well in the first preseason game. Uh, he's got some juice to him. They, I think his Twitter handle is Juice Herbert, which, <laughs> you know, it's fitting because that's what he has. That, you know, he's an explosive guy. He's, you know, fast. He's shifty. But he's also, he's got a low center of gravity because he's shorter. Uh, but he's got like a thick lower body and he's able to, you know, just keep his legs churning and bounce off a tackle. So I think there's a high ceiling with him too. I'm interested in seeing what kind of role he has as a rookie. Cause again, that backfield is kind of crowded, but I really like his long-term uh, outlook for the bears. Yeah. And I mean, the bears have been renowned for their defense for decades now, and that, that's sort of what they've hung their hat on. But in this year's draft, at least they chose to primarily focus on the offense. So 
given the fact that obviously the bears have this reputation as a hard nosed defensive team, but didn't really bring in any star studded pieces to bolster that defense. Like what's your outlook on the defensive side of the ball for this year? Are, are you thinking that, you know, it's going to be a wildly optimistic year or do you have a little bit of cause for concern on that side of the ball? Uh, I think a little bit of both. I think that the front seven uh, when healthy is one of the best in the league. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, Khalil Mack is, you know, he is who he is at this point, and he's an incredible, you know, edge rusher who he's the kind of guy that, you know, offense is playing around. It's like, okay, we got to double team him. We got to make sure, you know, we use tight ends to chip block him and stuff like that. Focus on him. But you've also got Akeem Hicks, who's still really good. Uh, Eddie Goldman, who's coming back. Bilal Nichols, Mario Edwards, a defensive line who are both very underrated uh, from a national perspective. I don't think they get enough credit. Uh, and then we'll see what happens with Robert Quinn. Obviously he didn't play as well as the bears expected him to, uh, but he was also battling through injuries. So I'm kind of interested in seeing what happens with him. And then Roquan Smith up front is true. You know, he's stepping in as one of the best young linebackers in the league today. Uh, Danny Trevathan's taking a little bit of a step back, but he's still decent. You know, he's not as good as he was a couple of years ago, but he's not bad. He's still, a, you know, a reliable run defender. If there's anything I have concern with, though, it's the secondary because the Bears are relying a lot on, you know, pretty low investment at the cornerback position because you got Jalen Johnson, who's a second round pick. Uh, you're, you know, you're st- expecting him to step in as a uh, cornerback one uh, in just his second year where he was coming off, you know, shoulder injuries near the end of his rookie year. So that's a little concerning, but he was really good as a rookie. So I think there's a lot of promise there with him, but outside of that, you got Desmond Trufant, who's on a veteran minimum one year deal. You've got Duke Shelley, Kendall Vilder, Thomas Graham, Jr. All of those guys are, you know, fifth or sixth round draft picks. None of them have, you know, necessarily that high, uh, pedigree. And that's not to say that late round picks can't contribute because they definitely can, but it's a little bit more risky to be relying so heavily on them, especially with, you know, players who are as unproven as they are. Uh, and then safety, I'm, you know, encouraged with Eddie Jackson, Tayshawn Gibson solid. I think that this new defensive scheme will benefit Eddie Jackson a lot more and see him playing up top as opposed to uh, moving him in the box a bit more. I think that having him, uh, you know, ranging in like those two high shells, I think is going to be really beneficial for him uh, as a playmaker, but it's the cornerback position. I have the most, you know, concern about, and that it might be the most valuable position on a defense. So that, you know, that's not a great position to have all those concerns that I do think the defense is still going to be an above average unit. Uh, not quite elite. I, I think they're, you know, couple pieces away from that but i do think it's going to be a very good unit oh you're preaching to the choir right now as far as secondary concerns there philadelphia (laughs) oh my god give give me cardiac palpitations every time that secondary takes the field but uh (laughs) i i mean if we were gonna maybe pick one player on the defensive side of the ball one player on the offensive side of the ball doesn't have to necessarily be a rookie but just someone who you think is poised for a breakout season who are those types of players that you're really focusing on in Chicago this year? Yeah. So on offense, I'm going to go with Darnell Looney. I really think that he surpassed expectations as a rookie, uh, even my own. And I was, I was a big fan of Darnell Mooney coming out of Tulane last year. Uh, but I think that having, you know, Justin Fields at quarterback or even Andy Dalton is an upgrade over what they had last year. Uh, and if they can have a quarterback who can stretch the field a bit more, Darnell Mooney is really fast. And obviously he did really well with, you know, creating separations on those shorter and intermediate routes, but they didn't fully get to unlock his deep ball potential last year. If you get a guy like Dalton or, you know, Justin Fields, especially who can stretch the field and hit his targets on the deep ball, then I think there's a lot of potential for Darnell Mooney to break out and really have great production. Uh, So he's the guy I'm looking for this year to truly break out. Defense, it's a little bit tougher. I'm not going to lie. I do think that as they don't have a ton of, you know, truly young up and coming guys and Roquan Smith already had his breakout year. So I can't say him, I guess I'm going to go with Jalen Johnson. I think that him being as, you know, the number one corner on that roster now, 
Uh, I think that the expectations are going to be high for him, but I also think that he's an intelligent player. He's, you know, fluid and physical. He's got everything you want out of a boundary cornerback. Uh, and I, 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 it's my belief that, you know, he finished top 10 in the league and pass deflections and he missed three games last year. I think if he can put that all together, he can truly, you know, turn some of those uh, deflections into interceptions and be a true playmaker. It doesn't even have to be like a, you know, six or seven, you know, pick year, just maybe like two or three and then still finish double digits and pass deflections. I think that's going to be, you know, a, a nice upgrade at corner. And I think that him taking that next step could really be beneficial. Cause like I said, there are concerns at the cornerback positions of Jalen Johnson can break out, which I think he can. I think that's going to be huge for the bears. Yeah. Well, million dollar question that I'm sure everyone in Chicago is asking themselves these days. Is this a playoff team for 2021 that they see in the bears or are they going to be on the outside looking in this year? Uh, I, I don't think they are. Honestly, I, I think that, you know, there's definitely talent on this roster and I don't think they're going to be a bad team. If anything, I think they'll be pretty solid. They have a very tough schedule this year though. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get it. Schedule is fluid. You know, teams aren't the same, you know, year to year as, you know, as one would expect, but I, I still think they're facing a lot of talented teams and that could be tougher, especially for, you know, either a rookie quarterback or for Andy Dalton, who's, you know, still better than Foles or Trubisky, but, you know, he's a below average quarterback, you know, for, for a starter perspective, you know, call it like it is. Uh, but I, I, I think that there's, they're going to be in that playoff hunt for a while. I think, you know, on those graphics, you're going to be seeing them there for, you know, most of the year. Uh, but I, I think they're just going to come up short because the NFC has got a lot of talented teams. I think, Anyone from the NFC West, I think, could make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, all four of those teams could. And as far as other wild card teams, you know, whoever doesn't win the NFC East, I think if the Cowboys don't win, I think they could make it. Washington football team, I think that they're a sleeper this year. Uh, so there's, you know, going to be competition for those, you know, final wild card spots. And, you know, that's assuming that the Packers win the NFC North. Uh, but I think the Bears are just going to come up short. I think 2022 is the year that they, you know, make the jump into being a playoff team. 2023 is the year I think they're really going to, you know, be in the hunt, you know, at the top of the NFC there. But 2021, I think, is more of more of the same. I think they'll be pretty average and, you know, a learning curve. But, hey, if – if Justin Fields plays well down the stretch, I don't, I won't necessarily care if they make the playoffs or not. I'm just looking forward to the future here. Absolutely. Well, Jacob, we appreciate you taking the time to hop on with us. For those that are listening though, that want to either connect with you on social media or, you know, see any of your pieces that you do writing for, like where are the best places to find your stuff these days? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you guys can, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jacob Infante 24. That's uh, Jacob I N F A N T E 24. Uh, you can find my, my bears work over at Windy city gridiron. Uh, and I do NFL draft stuff there. Uh, obviously not as much, you know, this early, but you know, down the stretch later on in the year, I'll be doing a lot more draft stuff. Uh, and I also do NFL draft work over at the draft wire from time to time. So you know, those are the places you can find my written work. Uh, I've got, you know, a, a podcast, radio show, whatever you want to call it, uh, called The Rough Draft. Uh, that's going to be starting up in a couple weeks here again uh, down in Columbia, Missouri. So, yeah, you know, make sure to check those out and then follow me on Twitter again at Jacob Infante 24. Beautiful. Well, again, appreciate you taking the time. And uh, yeah, we'll see whether it's going to be a week one Justin Fields show or if uh, we've got to wait a little bit longer for the Bears to debut their shiny new toy there at the NFL level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. I'm excited to see how the whole season plays out. I think there's, you know, a lot of room for optimism, you know, not just this year, but going forward. And that's something that I haven't really been able to say about the Bears very often in my lifetime. So that feels pretty good. Thank you.